Thanks for listening to the sermon podcast from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. Our vision is winning souls, making disciples, and planning churches. You're about to hear a message that was preached live from one of our recent church services. We hope that you'll open your heart to hear the Holy Spirit speaking directly through this message. Stay tuned after the message for information on how to get connected with us. Thanks again, and enjoy today's message. Let's open up our Bibles tonight. Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And as I mentioned uh, this morning, this is kind of like a part two to my message this morning. And if you were not here, I think most everybody was here, or maybe a couple. Um, you, you heard a message about friendship, about helping friends in their time of need. And tonight's message is, is going to be similar. We're going to also read another account from the life of David, uh, except this is a time when he desperately needed a friend and didn't have one. And the consequences were tremendous. And I want to, uh, I want to preach a message I've titled, A Culture of Accountability. How many uh, NBA fans we have here tonight? NBA fans? I love uh, watching basketball. You cannot deny the winning record of the most winning coach of all time. Anybody know who it is? Greg Popovich, San Antonio Spurs. In 2022, uh, he uh, officially notched his 1,336th regular season victory, which made him the most winning coach of all time. That is an incredible record. Uh, in July of last year, 2023, he signed another five-year contract, uh, which will keep him with the Spurs through the 27-28 season. And you have to wonder what kind of what kind of culture is in the San Antonio Spurs locker room that would cause them to have such incredible long-term success. And in an interview that they did with Time Magazine, they discovered it was just 19 words. There are three points to the culture that Coach Pop creates in his locker room. Number one, you are part of this group. Number two, this group is special and we have high standards here. Number three, I believe you can reach those standards. That is the message he puts into every rookie, and to every veteran. And whoever management puts under his coach, uh, coaching staff, no matter uh, who the talent is that he currently has, Coach Pop builds, he doesn't just coach a team. He builds men. And this is the culture that he has created there in the San Antonio Spurs locker room. You are part of this group. This group is special. We have high standards. Number three, I believe you can reach those standards. So in other words, tonight the Spurs, as much as I hate them, because they beat my sons all the time, the Spurs do not succeed because they are good at basketball. They succeed because they are skilled at something far more important, building strong relationships. And it is strong relationships which will keep us, and it is the lack of strong relationships which can lead to our downfall if we are not very, very careful. In the scripture we're about to read, we find David at perhaps the pinnacle of his power, a very different situation that we read about this morning. Now David has become the king, and he has, uh, he has done incredible works for the kingdom. He has brought the... Ark of the Covenant, back to Jerusalem. He has built uh, a palace for the king. He has made preparations or is in the process of making preparations to build a temple. Uh, God would not allow him to do that because his hands were stained with blood from fighting for the kingdom. But God gave that task to his son Solomon. But uh, the, 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 the short version of the story is that He has done a lot of great things and finds himself at a pinnacle of of power. He has built the kingdom to a point that no one before him and no one since, uh, with the exception of his son Solomon, 
would experience. And in a moment of unvarnished carnality, he makes a grievous error. It's a stain on the mark of his, uh, his kingship. And yes, he will pray that God will forgive him, and God will indeed forgive him for his sins. But his kingdom, after this point, will never be the same. It is the beginning of the end of his righteous rule. And as much as we want to uh, shy away from, from you know, painful circumstances, it is important for us to peer into these stories in the Bible, to contemplate them and think about them, because how many understand these stories are put there for a purpose? These stories are for us to learn from, to grow from, to, uh, to understand in our own lives. And in this moment of weakness, David makes a horrible mistake. But the worst thing about this tragedy is that it doesn't have to be this way. At any moment, someone could have stopped him, but nobody did. And so that's why I want to preach about a culture of accountability. Let's read together 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning with verse 1, uh, tonight from the New King James Version. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. That's weird. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed. That's weird. And he walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her. She came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Amen. A culture of accountability. Father, we come by the blood of Jesus. We need you to help us tonight. I pray for your grace and anointing on this message, God, that we would be able to hear your word being spoken to our hearts individually. God, that in this congregation and in this fellowship and in this, in this, uh, in this time that we are living, this time of great moral uh, failures all around us, there is, uh, there is a depravity that is growing, darkness with every passing day. And I'm praying, God, that in our, in, in our lives, in our families, and in our church, that we would build a culture of accountability, that we would not slip and slide with the times, but, God, we would hold true to your standards. Give us eyes to see tonight, even in ourselves, if there is something that is in us that is evil that needs to come out. We need you desperately to help us in Jesus' mighty name. God's people would say, amen. amen. Let's look, first of all, at some missing convictions. Now, we know the story of David. I've, you've heard multiple. You've heard probably hundreds of sermons out of the life of David. And uh, for, it's for a good reason. David is a great man of God. The, the Bible says that God called him a man after God's own heart. That uh, his early life and his early career in the kingdom was extremely wonderful. That he fought the lion and the bear, and this gave him the courage and the strength to go and courageously fight against Goliath. And he became a champion uh, of the people uh, to the point where we saw this morning how, how the people of Israel would, would sing about the victory of David and all of, his, uh, all of the enemies that he had killed and conquered. And we not only see that he's a great warrior, but we also see he's a great man of God. How many have read the book of Psalms, have found comfort in the prayers of David, have found incredible solace and the, the revelation that he had uh, that, that even when he was experiencing great difficulty and pain, that he would cry to God and he would play his instrument and he would be filled with the presence of God and even the spirit of God would fill him from time to time and would lead him to write these psalms which have been passed down through generations and have strengthened billions of people over time. That is, that is part of his great legacy. We also know 
that David was a man who was sensitive to the convictions of the Holy Spirit. There was a moment in the cave where where Saul is pursuing David and he and his men are hiding deep in the depths of the, the cave where Saul has stopped to relieve himself and use the bathroom uh, on the side of the battlefield. And there he is, and, uh, and th- the men around him are saying, hey, this is your opportunity, David. Take his head off. And David creeps closely behind King Saul, gets close enough, but in that moment, he doesn't kill him. We know the story. He takes out his knife and he simply cuts off a corner of Saul's robe. And uh, this is in order to prove to him, I could have killed you, but I didn't. But then we see this, we read this verse in 1 Samuel 24, verse 5. It happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. You see his, his conviction there. He said, I believe that God puts men in power. And who am I to Take a corner off of his robe. Who do I think I am? His heart troubled him because of that. You know what that is? That's called high standards. That's a culture. He was holding himself accountable because why? One day he's going to become king. He has been anointed king and he is believing, he is hoping that somebody someday is going to have that same kind of respect toward him. Because he respects God, he respects this foolish man, King Saul. And when he cuts even the corner of his robe, he says, Ah, how could I have done such a thing? You know, you pray for people to have convictions like that. You pray that that when not even doing something terrible, I mean, that's not like it was written in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not cut the king's robe. But just the mere idea of an attack on the king and and his heart was convicted over that so a man that has those kinds of convictions will not enter into worse kinds of things right this is why we uh, as believers we have boundaries we have certain convictions for ourselves this is not something that i can preach over the pulpit but this is these are things that that as uh, as a man i know that there are some things that i cannot do There are some places that I cannot go. It's not because it's written in the Bible, thou shalt not not go down this certain road and uh, visit that certain person. No, but because of actions, there are some things that I don't allow myself to do because those are boundaries. And when I cross those boundaries, it makes it more difficult to live for God. So this is who David is and who he was, his record in the Scriptures. And in our scripture that we read tonight, we see some major mistakes and mistakes that lead to more mistakes. How many figured that out in life? When you make mistakes, they lead to greater mistakes. When you make little sins, they lead to bigger sins. When you have small foolishness, it leads to bigger foolishness. And this is the exact problem with with David in our scripture. So let's let's examine this. Let's take this apart a little bit. So the first thing that we read is that David stayed home when it was time to go fight. Verse 1, it was the spring of the year, and it was the time when kings go out to battle. Very obvious. The Bible says this is the time when kings should be going out to battle. But instead, David sent Joab. At the end of the verse, it says, David remained in Jerusalem. David stayed home when it was time to fight. So you might you might say, well, you know David's fought a lot of battles. David's done his time. It's time to pass the torch to another generation. Let let somebody else fight. I'm tired. But that's a mistake, isn't it? He stayed home when it was time to fight. How many times have I seen people Take a step back from ministry. Take a step back from prayer. Take a step back from Bible study. Take a step back from engaging in the battle. And that is only the first step. How many times, listen, you can, you can often tell somebody's heart by their generosity or lack thereof. 
when they stop tithing. It's always concerning because it's a, it's a mistake that can lead to other mistakes. The second mistake here is that he sends others without being willing to go himself. It said David sent Joab. Now, Joab was a very capable general. He was a, he was a well-experienced man. David trusted him with his army, and he was deserving of that trust. But the problem here is that David is unwilling to go and be at Joab's side. He is, he is in vacation mentality. He is saying to himself, oh, I've done my time. I've fought my fights. And now it's time for King David to take a break. Hello? Sometimes we get to feeling like that for ourselves. Man, I just need a little rest. And and I'm not knocking rest. We all need to make sure our bodies are well taken care of. We need to make sure that uh, we don't get burnt out, that we, you know, we have a a fresh fire that we can apply for the kingdom of God. But I want to tell you, be careful. It is, it is, I, I have seen too many times people take a vacation and come back with their head hanging low. Or go visit family in some far off state where you're removed from your, your, uh, your, your normal schedule. And there are greater temptations waiting for you. David sent Joab and his servants, and it says all Israel. You know another problem with that? is that now that David has sent his best men out to do the battle, now the only ones left are men without convictions. We're going to get to them in a moment. When it comes time for someone to stand up and say, David, don't do this thing. Nobody's there. They're all out fighting. The third thing I see in this scripture is that the Bible says he arose from his bed. Verse 2, it happened one night that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. You know, it's a good thing to stay in bed when it's time for sleeping. How how, How many of the worst days of your life happened when you should have been in bed sleeping? How many people do you know that that, uh, that the worst thing that ever happened to them happened when they decided not to go to bed and get some rest. He's up all night when he's supposed to be sleeping. You know what happens when you're supposed to be sleeping and you stay up? Not good things. You know, you, you should go to bed when it's bedtime. Right, Taya? <laughs> My wife is a strong believer. The fourth, re- the fourth thing that I see, the mistake that he made, is that he begins to entertain an illicit idea. Verse 2, from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Now, the question that I have for you is, who takes a bath on the roof? <laughs> so you have to ask yourself, why was this happening, and why was it happening so close to, the, to the, the palace where David was living. I believe that there was a lonely woman who saw an opportunity. She knew that she was within visibility of the king's palace, and she knew that her husband was away fighting, and so she didn't know if it would uh, produce anything, but uh, she said, who knows what could happen if I showed off a little too much in a place that I shouldn't be seeking attention from a successful and powerful king of Israel. Now, this does not remove any responsibility from David, does it? But it does tell us that David could have shut that down. David could have spoken to his servants and said, there's some stupid woman taking a bath out there in public view of everyone. Go tell her to put her clothes on and stay inside. He could have done that, couldn't he? But he didn't. The next mistake that he made was that he began to behold forbidden beauty. The Bible said here, the woman was very beautiful to behold. 
Now, that might be true, but that beauty did not belong to David, did it? It was not for him to behold. And David began to think things that kings should not think. And he began to do things that kings should not do. And I am fearful tonight, and I just in passing want to mention that this is not a mistake of one king uh, 3,000 years ago that is isolated. How many understand tonight that this is a mistake that men make on a regular basis? You don't even have to... uh, to commit full-time adultery, but uh, listen, staying up too late in a time when you should be doing something else and beholding beauty that doesn't belong to you. Hello? Pornography? And the statistics are frightening for Christian men between... For Christian men, listen to these statistics. Christian men between 18 and 30 years old, it says 77% look at pornography at least once a month. 36% view it on a daily basis. 32% admit to being addicted to pornography. And that's only the ones who admit it. Christian men. That's for the young men. The middle-aged men are not any better. Ages 31 to 49, 77% looked at pornography within the past three months. 64 view pornography at least once a month. 18% admit to being addicted to pornography. 18, that's only the ones who admit it. Are Are you listening to me? This is not a problem of David 3,000 years ago. This is a problem of Christian men today who in the middle of the night when they're supposed to be sleeping in a time when kings go to battle are viewing things and beholding things that they should not behold. Hello? But that's not what I'm preaching about tonight. So if this was the end of the story, David still could have avoided incredible heartache. If this was all that had happened, we probably would not be reading about it all these thousands of years later. There was another more critical failure that happened in the palace that night. And that was a failure of his servants. I don't want you to think about this for a moment. Now, we know David is accountable for this. David is the one who initiates this. We know that. But I want you to consider something tonight that when I read this again, that popped out to me and and stuck in my mind, and that is that David could not have done this without help. Listen carefully tonight. The Bible identifies that there are people that David employed in pursuing this married woman. There was a failure of culture. There was a failure of leadership. And what is that failure? The failure is that David had to ask other people to help him in pursuit of committing this sin. Look at verse 3. David sent and inquired about the woman. So he's asking about her. Who is he asking? He is asking someone in his palace guard. He's asking someone who's a servant there. It's an unnamed servant, but it's someone close enough to have the ear of the king. And this certain someone that is speaking to him, you get the hint here that he's trying to push back a little bit on David's desires. Listen to what this someone says to him. Is this not Bathsheba? The daughter of Eliam, he says, hey, don't forget, David, this is somebody's daughter. He says, wait a second, this is the wife of Uriah. This is somebody's wife, David, Uriah, the Hittite. So you get a hint here, this servant, whoever he's talking to, is trying to get David to snap out of it. Hey, David, King David, this is not yours. This woman doesn't belong to you. This is somebody's daughter. This is somebody's wife. Unfortunately, that little hint was not enough. It was not strong enough to change the mind. It was not strong enough to overcome the carnality of the moment. And the next thing that happens, verse 4, David sent messengers. Say messengers. They took her 
and she came to him. Okay, so here's my question. Where's the people that should have been pushing back? Where's the people that should have said, no, king? Where are they? That's right. He sent them all up. He sent all of his good men out to battle and didn't leave anybody close enough to him to say, no, king, don't do this. And that is a failure of leadership. David made a critical error. Number one, he decided to stay home. Number two, he sent his best men to the battlefield. So there was nobody left to tell him, do not do this. And so you, you remember what I preached this morning, how, how desperately David needed in a moment, he needed a friend to come and encourage him so that he could continue on, right? This is exactly the same thing that David in this moment, he needed someone to say, please, David, don't do this thing. And we know David has a history of responding to common sense. You remember the story of Nabal. And Nabal is a foolish man. In fact, that's his name. I don't know why you would name your kid Nabal or why he would have this nickname, but uh, he lived up to his name. And uh, the story of Nabal is that he offends King David. And David says, guys, pick up your swords. We're going to go kill him. And as they're, they're coming close to Nabal's house, they're going to take his head off of his shoulders. But out comes a wise woman named Abigail, right? Wife of Nabal. I'm cooking up a sermon about, about wise women married to idiots. That's a little, little preview. But here's Abigail, and she comes out to meet David. She's got gifts. She's, she comes bowing low to him, and she says, listen, I know, I know dude's a fool. I know he's an idiot. He said some stupid things, but please, David, don't do this thing. Don't tarnish your reputation by killing a man who doesn't deserve to be killed. Let God deal with him. And when she, get, when she gets done speaking to him, what does she say? What does he say? He says, oh, thank you, woman. Thank you. You have spoken wisely. He said, guys, she's right. Put our swords back. We're going to go home tonight. We're not going to kill him. And let God deal with that situation. He has a history. If someone would have spoken to him in that moment, he could have saved his himself from great embarrassment. He could have saved himself from from uh, breaking all ten of the Ten Commandments. He could have saved his one of his greatest soldiers, Uriah the Hittite. He could have saved future heartache when his son is going to die as a result of this great sin. And he could have this moment. This moment in David's life, it's like a it's like a hinge. It's like a point of history that before this time, there's God's incredible blessing and favor. But after this point, the rest of his reign as king is going to be mired in rebellion and in bloodshed. God removes his blessing off King David's rule. We know that God works all things together for the good. But the truth is, the reality is that this is a hinge point. In David's life, there's a price to pay. Where is the Abigail to speak to him? To talk some sense. Where is the man of God? Where is the Jonathan? Where is the trusted advisor who's going to step in and say, King, I don't think you should do this. Think it through. So, let's talk about how to establish an environment of convictions because that's what we need. Every one of us, listen, if, if you just leave it up to your own strength and hope that you're going to do everything right, it's probably not going to work out well for you. Every one of us needs an environment, needs an atmosphere of conviction in our life. We need to establish boundaries. We need to have, in our church, we need to have an attitude of holiness. That we expect people to live at a certain standard of righteousness. 
Because without that expectation, without that, without that uh, uh, atmosphere or culture, it is very quickly we turn into the time of judges where everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And that doesn't turn out well. So let's look at convictions, establishing a culture of accountability. Number one, it means that we must surround ourselves with people who are so in tune with God and his word that they are willing to stand up to the king. Willing to deny an order of someone that you love and respect when they are in the wrong. Now, I want to tell you that is not an easy thing to do. It is not an easy thing. But we have to have a culture in our church where if I approach you and I ask you as the pastor, and I'm going to ask you to do something that is out of bounds, biblically speaking, that you have enough common sense and you have enough biblical knowledge to say, Pastor, I love you, but no, you shouldn't do this. Think it through. You need to pray a little bit longer, Pastor. This is the kind of convictions that we must have in the culture of accountability. This is why many churches are led astray. This is why many pastors are mired in secret sin because they don't have anybody close enough to them to be able to speak into their lives. I thank God that I have a pastor also. He is able to correct me. I thank God that I have peers, other pastors that I keep in contact with that I call on a regular basis. I thank God that there are men in this congregation that we talk and we have conversations and and I am not accountable to no one. I need accountability. That I have a wife who sees me a lot more than you do. And she is able, and even though I don't really like it, she is able, she is able To say, hey, cut it out. And then I'll say, okay. It's important to have a friend when you're in trouble. But you know, a friend, a friend is for more than just accountability. Hold on a second. Let me try that again. A friend is for more than just encouragement. Sometimes a friend needs to wound you. Proverbs 27, verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, in the kingdom, we have to develop relationships. We have to have people close enough to us that can, that when you're stuck on stupid, somebody can say to you, hey, knock it off. Hey, have some sense. Think this through. And we have to not only be willing to receive that, but we as believers, we have to be willing to deliver that sometimes. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I'm not asking you to be the Holy Spirit for somebody else. You know, there there are people who think that they're the Holy Spirit. They're going to go around and correct everyone around them. They're the ones who, you know, see the specks in everyone's eyes when there's a two by four sticking out of their face. I'm not talking about that, but I am talking about when you see a friend that you know is headed in the bad direction, when you see someone stuck on stupid, when you see someone in carnality making bad decisions or speaking evil words, there have to be a culture where it's okay for you to stand up and say, please consider your ways respectfully and lovingly. Charles Spurgeon said, be much with the solid teachings of God's word and you would become solid and substantial men and, w- men and women. Drink, it, drink them in and feed upon them and they shall produce in you a Christ likeness at which the world shall stand astonished. In other words, each and every one of us needs our own connection to the word of God. We each need to know the, what is true. What, is the, what are the standards that we're supposed to be holding to? You need to know that for yourself so that if I preach something that's sideways, you can open up your Bible and say, Pastor, but what about this? 
You need to be able to do that for your friends in the kingdom, for your family members, for your co-workers. I thank God that in David's life, listen, he had sent all of his best men away. And that was probably the, the greatest reason for his downfall here. But David did have a Nathan. And Nathan was a prophet. But that didn't make it any easier when Nathan had to confront David. We read about it this morning in our Sunday school, didn't we? And Nathan came and he gave David this little parable about a poor man who has a sheep and he treats it as his pet. He has a name for it. This is, this is my little pet sheep. His name is Goofy. I don't know. <laughs> and he held it. And the Bible said he, he loved it and it sat on his lap and it was like one of his children. It lived in his house. And the rich man had a guest coming over, and he decided he's going to cook lamb chops that night. He's got a whole field full of lamb, but instead, he takes the pet lamb from his neighbor. And Nathan is telling this story to David, and Nathan says, what do you think about this situation? And David says, that man needs to die. He stole what didn't belong to him. And here's what Nathan does. You're the man, David. Can I ask you something? Is that easy to do for Nathan? That's very uncomfortable, isn't it? To put your finger in the chest of someone that you care about and love and you respect as a king, you respect his office, you respect his position, you respect his history, but you also know that he can't continue hiding the sin. Nathan has to put his finger in his chest and say, that's you, David. That's what you've done. You need to get your heart right. You know, I think the kingdom of God is missing some prophet Nathans these days. Men and women willing to convict, willing to, willing to point out in a loving and convicting way, confront evil. You know, the, the apostle Paul writes the letter to the Cor- Corinthians and he says, Hey guys, hey, in your church there are things happening which are shameful. You cannot let this to continue. You have to purge out the old leaven before it spreads throughout the congregation. He's willing to call it out. He's willing to not be their friend for a minute so that they can get right. We saw it in in the, the Chosen episode last night. You know why John the Baptist, why his head ended up on that platter, right? You know why? Because he preached to the multitudes. And he said, what Herod is doing is wrong. He's committing adultery. And he preached that on the street. And that was embarrassing to the king. But John the Baptist is willing to preach that. He's willing to call it out. And call sin, sin. It's not a mistake. It's not just a a, a momentary act of failure. John the Baptist is confronting the king Herod and his illicit marriage, and guess what? They took his head off for it. In a congregation, in a church, in a family, we have to establish a culture of accountability. Just like Greg Popovich did in his basketball teams, he said, guess what? You're a part of this group, and this group has high standards. You can fight against it if you want to. You just make it harder on yourself. Be better if you, uh, if I, I believe in you that you are able to meet these standards. And I say the same thing to everyone here. We do have high standards. We have high standards as a church. We have high standards because we get our standards from the Word of God. We are not going to lower the standards for you. We're not going to pull pages out of the Bible to make you more comfortable. That would be like Greg Popovich lowering lowering the height of the basketball hoop because somebody wasn't feeling good that day. You can't do that. The standards remain. And sometimes we're going to have to call one another out. We're going to have to instill these convictions. What kind of convictions do we need, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Number one, we need to instill in every person a fear of God. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. 
When's the last time you heard that one quoted in your local mega church? Probably not too often, right? But those, those are words in red. That's Jesus. Jesus says, fear the one who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. On that day, David forgot his fear of God, didn't he? David, in a momentary lapse or carnality, his flesh began crying out. And in that moment, he lost his fear of God. But you wish that there was somebody close enough to him to say, don't you remember, David, there is, there is going to be a consequence. God is not mocked. You will reap what you sow, David. You wish that somebody was there to say, don't forget God. God is going to see this, even if other people don't. You wish somebody would have put the fear of God back in him. This is why we have personal convictions. These are not things that, uh, again, these, these are not things that, you know, standards that I can preach over the pulpit, but we have to, each one of us, have to establish certain boundaries for ourselves. Things I don't do, people I don't see, places I don't go. Because I know that it could open a door. The Word of God says, avoid even the very appearance of evil. Why? If something appears evil, it might not be, but it could lead that direction. I don't meet with females without my wife present. I don't do that. Well, pastor, that might be prude of you. Well, you know, I'd rather be perceived as prude than to instill an image or open a possibility, an appearance of evil. If David would have had a boundary for himself, it could have saved him. Think, uh, think on the other side. Here's, here's Queen Esther. You remember the story of Queen Esther? Queen Esther, she is close enough to the king, at that, uh, the king of Persia. There's this whole plot going on to destroy the Jews, and, and she, she is in a position to do something about it. And she has a, a, an uncle, a close advisor, who says to her, Listen, Esther... We know that God's going to protect his people, and he'll either use you or somebody else, but you're in the position. So you better use that, Esther. Don't miss this opportunity. Thank God that there was someone there to talk some sense into her, to inspire her, to give her some faith, to go and stand before the king and plead on behalf of the Jewish people who were about to be slaughtered. Don't you wish? Listen, don't we all need somebody in our lives that can say, hey, don't be an idiot. <laughs> Snap out of it. Wake up. Hey, God's watching. Don't do this thing. If David would have had a culture of accountability, number one, he could have saved himself from failure. Number two, he could have saved others from dying as a result, Uriah and the child and others. Number three, he could have retained the supernatural protection of God's blessing. We don't know. Maybe things could have gone differently. But because all of his closest friends were far away, David missed out. He missed out on having uh, accountability. Listen, we don't like accountability, do we? We don't like people holding us accountable. It's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's, it's a little icky. But I want to tell you, it'll save you. It'll save you from future harm, from, from a future embarrassment. Oh, if, if David could have endured somebody saying, hey, buddy, don't do this, that would have been uncomfortable. But you know what's more uncomfortable? What actually happened. And the price that he had to pay for that. I want to challenge you tonight. In your life, in your family, and together as a community of faith, 
We have to uphold a culture of accountability. Will you help me with that tonight? Would you be willing even to hold me accountable? I pray that you would. But not just me, anyone here. You know, I've been in situations, there have been times when information comes to my attention uh, that somebody else is involved in something that they shouldn't be involved in. Do you know the best way to handle that that I've discovered? Okay, let's imagine you, uh, you have become aware of a situation that a married man is hanging out with another woman who's not his wife, and you find out about it. What do you do with that information? The wrong thing to do would be to sit on it. Pretend it didn't happen. The right thing to do would be just like this. Watch this. This is, this is some wisdom. I'll throw this in for free. You ready for this? This will help everyone. You don't put it on social media. You don't put it on blast. The first thing you do is you go to that man and you tell him or you ask him, is this true? Give him a chance to fess up. If it's true, then here's what you say. Okay, if this is true, we can't just keep it to ourselves. There's consequences for something like this. Other people need to know, especially your wife. So you say, I'll give you three days to do the right thing. You go tell her. You go fess up, buddy, and pay the price. And if you don't do it within three days, then I will be forced to do it for you. So what that does is it puts, it puts the, the responsibility back on the person who is in trouble. And it, it removes you from that position of, of, uh, of uh, pro- providing more, greater leverage. You give them time to do what's right. Okay? And then if they're not able to, they're not strong enough, then at that point, you don't have another choice. The information has to come out. It has to be exposed. Sin has to be dealt with. Come on, people. It's only right. And if it doesn't come out, listen, it'll come out. Jesus said, what is done in the secret place will be shouted from the rooftops. If not in this life, then in the life to come, right? Better that it come out early. I want to challenge. See, this is how we build a culture of accountability. This is not meddling in other people's affairs. This is not Jerry Springer show. All things should be done with wisdom, with courage, with love, but also with truth. And I want to challenge church, I want to challenge each and every one of us, that we need to be students of the Word of God. We need to be so closely connected to the Spirit that even when someone we love and respect is about to do something foolish, We have the courage to stand up and speak about it. Don't do this thing. Don't you wish David would have had somebody there? Don't you wish Joab would have been there? Don't you wish a Jonathan could have been there? An Abigail to say, hey, hey! Don't get involved here. Last thought. David is ultimately responsible for his own actions here. But I believe that those servants would bear a certain weight for it also. For the rest of their lives, they're going to remember, I helped with the downfall of King David. I helped. And the tailpipe said amen. Could you imagine having that on your conscience? I was there that day, and I could have stopped it. But instead, I became an ally of a man's wickedness. Don't let that be on your conscience tonight. Let's build a culture of accountability. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes for just a moment. We're going to bring the service to an end. And thank you for your patience. Before we close this service tonight, thank God for mercy. Thank God for His grace. Thank God that when David confronted his own sin, when finally Nathan exposed his evil, David cried out to God, and God forgave him. We serve a God who forgives. Thank God he is a God of mercy. The reason that God can show his mercy and grace is because of Jesus, because the price has been paid. 
And maybe you're here carrying a guilt and a weight, a shame in your heart tonight because of sin. Maybe tonight you're here and and, uh, there is secret sin. There's something that nobody else knows about. Maybe you found yourself uh, identifying with David in this moment. There was a time that you, you lost your sanity for a moment. You lost your fear of God and entered in to something that uh, if it became public, you'd be so embarrassed. Oh, but tonight there is mercy. There is forgiveness to those who will confess their sin and repent and turn to Jesus in time of need. If you need to do that tonight, don't miss this opportunity. Pastor, but it might be embarrassing. Yeah, it might be. But it's worth it. Be afraid tonight, not of the man who can just kill the body, but not the soul. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul. Fear of God. Tonight, if you need to get your heart right, oh, there's an opportunity because of Jesus Right now, if you would cry out for mercy, oh, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all iniquity. Amen. Right where you are tonight, we want to pray together. We want to believe God. Let's stand up to our feet right where you are tonight. I want to pray for this congregation. I'll pray for each person here tonight. And I want to mention one more thing right before we pray. Listen carefully tonight. You and I have an advantage that David did not have. Listen carefully. You and I have an advantage that David did not have. You know what that is? We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. There were times in the Old Testament when the Spirit would come upon people, but we have a new relationship after the new after the the after the resurrection of Christ. He ascended to heaven, and what did he send back to the church? The Holy Spirit. And one of the things the Holy Spirit does is he convicts men of their sins. He empowers us with resurrection, life, and power. And the Bible says that Spirit, that Holy Spirit, is the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. I ask you, is that Holy Spirit powerful enough to help us to conquer temptations. It is. He is powerful enough to help us in our time of need. So even if you don't have a friend in the world, you have an indwelling Spirit of God at work in your life who is able to help you. He is the helper. He is the comforter. He is the strengthener. He is the resurrection life and power. John 16, verse 8, When He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He lives in you. You are His temple. What does that mean? It means you don't have an excuse. You can't say, Pastor, I was just powerless. I couldn't, uh, there was nothing I could do. You don't get to say that. If you are bought by the blood, if you are born again, if you are in Christ, then He is in you by His Spirit. And that means you have some, something that David didn't have. That is victorious tonight. That is encouraging tonight. So we're going to claim that power of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to pray that God would build in our congregation, in our lives, in our families, in our workplaces, wherever we go, that there would be an atmosphere, a culture of accountability. Let's lift up our hands and say this prayer together. Say, God in heaven, thank you again for saving me. I don't deserve your grace or your mercy or your salvation, but you have provided it willingly. I thank you for saving someone like me and setting me free from sin. You promised, Lord, that you'd be with me even to the end of the age, that you would fill me with your Spirit. You would give me strength and power to overcome sin and to live holy. I receive that Spirit tonight. The spirit of holiness, spirit of righteousness. He is the Holy Spirit. 
And he lives in me to transform me every day into the likeness of image of, of Christ. Lord, don't let me make excuses for my sins, for my habits of darkness. Help me, Lord, to be accountable to other friends and family, to brothers and sisters in Christ. Help me to provide accountability to others that are in sin. Your word commands us to confess our sins, not only to you, but to one another. And this is how we build accountability. Help me tonight, Lord, to obey your word and to follow your Holy Spirit. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Even though this is a very hard story to talk about, because it involves the failure of a hero of our faith, and aren't you glad the Bible doesn't cover up the sins of its heroes? That's how you know it's a God book and not a human book. Because it puts the flaws of King David out there on display for all to see. But at the end of the day, this is not a depressing story. This is a helpful story. It's a warning, isn't it? It's a guardrail. When you're driving on a dangerous road, you better hope there's a guardrail that if you start bumping up against it, you might scrape up your car, but you're not going to go off the cliff. That's what this story is. It's a guardrail for us. And that we need to build this accountability into our lives so that we will have some guardrails, some boundaries, some places uh, that, that before we get close to the edge, that we start bumping up against somebody who cares about us. That we start having some conviction in our hearts. And we start thinking, oh, God, I can't do this thing against you and against my friends and family. I challenge you tonight, Lord, God, give us people who are committed to holiness in the secret place. Because, hey, uh, you can put on a good show for other people, but what really matters is who you are when nobody else is looking, who you are in the dark place who you are when you should be sleeping at night. Hey, maybe you should stay in bed instead of turning on the screen. You save yourself a lot of heartache. Sometimes you can see people walk into the house of the Lord and they're carrying it, aren't they? And you just wish there would have been someone there. Say, hey, you can do this. You don't have to enter into that. God surround us with people, friends, who are willing even to wound us when needed. Amen. We're going to close in prayer. I do want to encourage you this week. Amen. Let's pursue holiness. Let's pursue the kingdom of God. Let's seek first his kingdom and its righteousness. Hello? And all these other things will be added. It's worth it. Righteousness is expensive. But guess what? You get what you pay for. Thank you for listening to this message from the Potter's House Church in Virginia Beach. If you sense the Holy Spirit drawing you out of your sins and into a new life with Him, pray this prayer from your heart today. God in heaven, I know I've sinned against you. I've hurt people, I've hurt myself, and I've broken your laws. Today, I turn from my sins as I surrender to your perfect will. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son and that He died and rose again for me. I receive Him today as my Lord and Savior. May the old things of my past pass away as you make me a new creation. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit to give me strength to live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We want to help you live for God. Please join us in person for one of our upcoming church services. We are located in the heart of Virginia Beach at 1045 Lynn Haven Parkway, about one mile from the Lynn Haven Mall. Please check the show notes for links to our website and social media. You can also find a link to support this ministry with a generous donation. We would be so grateful. We look forward to sharing future messages here on the VBPH Sermon Podcast. In the meantime, we pray that God would strengthen you to serve Him with all your heart.